while we were studying Revelation 13, we, we got up to the verses which, which talk about uh, and how he caused all to receive the mark in their right hand and their foreheads and how those who wouldn't receive the mark were forbidden from buying and selling. And that's where I want to take up today. But there's a lot of history involved behind the way the financial system works that I feel that would be good for us to know to understand how this aspect of Babylon functions. Well, I've titled, subtitled this The Merchants of Babylon because in Revelation 18, you're, it's a whole chapter basically about the, the merchants of Babylon and, how, um, and, and this great system that, that they've been made rich by. And what I'd like to show is how much of an integral part these merchants are to the system of Babylon. But before we begin, we'll just read a spirit of prophecy quote about uh, the origin of Babylon. We all know in the plains of Shinar, where those men met and built the tower. We read in Patriarchs and Prophets, Here they decided to build a city, and in it a tower of such stupendous height, as should render it the wonder of the world. These Babel builders determined to keep their community united in one body and to found a monarchy that should eventually embrace the whole earth. You see here the beginning of globalism, the beginning of the consolidation of, of riches, wealth and power. It started a couple of generations after Noah. This was, this was Satan's design. Thus their city would become the metropolis of a universal empire, its glory would command the admiration and homage of the world. The men of Babel had determined to establish a government that should be independent of God. The people were fully united in their heaven-daring undertaking. Had they gone on unchecked, they would have demoralized the world in its infancy. Had this confederacy been permitted, a mighty power would have borne sway to banish righteousness and with it peace, happiness and security from the earth. So here we see the beginnings of Satan's design for the world. And this design has been continued ever since through the descendants of these, these same men and who, are, who have bound themselves up in secret societies. From Babylon is the origin where we get all the false teachings uh, which have evolved over time. But the Trinity, the original sin teaching, uh, and so many things came from this this. this this plain of Shinar. And that system that Satan designed through him not only was religious in doctrines, like, but it also was a system of total state control. We know prophetically that it started with Babylon, and the last kingdom is Rome, as we see here. The Roman Empire started in 63 BC, and it continued till the second coming of Christ. And, and this is an unbroken dominion that Rome has from that time. And we, we know from... Sermons we've seen, one, one notable sermon I, I remember was Brother Bill. He did a study on Revelation 17. And he went through the stages of Rome, that where it began in, from pagan Rome. And the seventh stage, the final stage, is a re-empowered papal Rome. But it's important to note that the, the Roman dominion never ceases. That dominion, is what I'm trying to say, is it still exists today. It has always existed ever since, ever since Rome came into existence. Last weekend, I was visiting some family, and interestingly, I was talking to a relative about how the Catholic Church rules the world. And she said that the Church is it's, it's not ruling the world, it's losing power, and it's weak these days in modern times. And I, I sort of laughed within myself, thinking that this is exactly what they want people to think. The truth is that Rome has never gained more universal control than she has during these times when she has been perceived as weak. I'm going to read a couple of quotes from a book called The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Uh, he was a general of uncertain historical existence, a Chinese general, that supposedly lived during the 6th century. This man most likely did not exist. Sun Tzu is an uncertain character who supposedly was born in 544 BC and was unknown to Western languages until Joseph Marie Amiot, an astronomer of the Emperor of China, brought forth a Jesuit edition of the 13, 13 articles in 1772. Amiot was a Jesuit priest under obedience to General Ricky. General Ricky was the Jesuit general at the time. So Amiot's son Su then can be presumed to be written by Lorenzo Ricci. This Art of War book was, was not 
was not written by Sun Tzu, it was written by the Jesuits. And what, the reason I'm showing is this is, is because within these words you see the tactics of the Jesuits. They, they, tr they hide the truth in plain sight. Lorenzo Ricci writes, All warfare is based on deception. Hence, when we are able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must appear inactive. When we are re near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When far away, we must make him believe we are near. Appear weak when you are strong, and strong when you are weak. The supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. This has been the policy of the Jesuits uh, ever since their existence. And I thought it was interesting the, the way that um, that relative spoke to me, because this is exactly the, what they have got the world to believe. And I thought of this verse in Daniel 8. Speaking of the papacy in his, in, when he's in, at this stage in, in, in history, it says, And through his policy he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart. By peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up again the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. You notice how by peace he shall destroy many? You notice how through his policy he shall cause craft to prosper? Now that word craft means, among other things, fraud, deceit. Now, what I'm going to apply to is not the only thing that this can be applied to. However, this is a main way we can see this craft used by the, the Jesuits and the Vatican to control the world. Now, this book and this general, general uh, Lorenzo Ricci lived in these times. This was leading up to the, the deadly wound stage of the papacy, which was from 1798 to 1929. And one thing I like to bring out is that during this, this deadly wound stage, the little, the little horn power, far from being inactive and weak, gained more ground worldwide than ever before. And through infiltration, wreaked havoc not only in the various Protestant churches, but in governments, taking control of their education, political and financial systems and emerged from its wounded stage as the most richest, powerful, and, and powerful entity in the world. Let us examine some scriptures regarding this power. It reads, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And who is this beast? In 17.4 we find out the clear hallmarks of who it is. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Now these are the hallmarks of the Roman Catholic Church, the purple, the scarlet, and the gold and the precious stones. These are, this is a clear identifying mark. And another thing in verse 18, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. This woman's seat of power is a city. It is a great city. And indeed... The Vatican City State, or State of the Vatican, is an independent state located within the city of Rome. With an area of 44 hectares and a population of about 1,000, it is the smallest state in the world by both area and population. The Vatican City has its own court system, its own police, its own prison, everything. It is a self-contained uh, city and, and the Pope is the sovereign ruler over that city. These are my words. The Vatican's solid gold bullion stored with the Rothschild Control Bank of England and the US Federal Reserve Bank is worth untold billions. The Vatican is the biggest financial power, wealth, accumulator and property owner in the world. She possesses more material wealth than any bank, corporation, giant trust or government anywhere on earth. So being the smallest city on earth, she is the richest and most powerful in the world. You've heard the saying, money is power. Well... If money is indeed power, which it is in this world, this is the, the most powerful state in the world. Another thing about this power, in the, back in Daniel 8, 24, it says, And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy many wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. It has been Rome's policy to use other 
other nations, other, other people to fight its battles and has continued to do this in modern times. It began back even in its earliest times. It recruited by the Tiber, the tribes there, recruited other nations near them and used them as mercenaries and, and, and that's how it, it gained its strength. And then when they conquered somebody, they, like, the, like the, the Gauls, they, they, they made legions out of them. It's always been Rome's policy to use those it conquers and others to fight its battles. The, the little horn, when it came into existence, when it plucked up the other three horns by the roots, the Heruli were, were stationed in Rome. They, had, they occupied that territory, and the Rome, Rome got the Ostrogoths to come and, and invade them and push them out. And then they weren't happy with the Ostrogoths, so they, they called Justinian from the eastern side of the Roman Empire uh, and get Belisarius over to destroy both the Vandals and the Ostrogoths, their, um, their enemies, to to eliminate all those Aryan nations that um, stood in defiance of Rome and her teachings, particularly the Trinity. So you can see here how Rome has a mighty power, but it's not by its own power. It always employs the, the strengths of others in its service. Now let's examine one of the Little Horn's chief agencies in gaining dominion in later times, in more modern times. We read here in... Revelation 18, where we've been reading a lot, it reads, And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. This is talking about Babylon when she comes to her end. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, Babylon, that mighty city, for one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth, shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. Notice here this, this element that's being introduced is the merchants of the earth. They were a very integral part of this system of Babylon. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones, of pearls and fine linen. So here we've got mining here. Fine linen, purple, silk and scarlet, and the whole clothing industry. Wood and all manner of vessels of ivory. All manner of vessels of most precious wood of brass and iron and marble. These merchants, they deal in everything. And cinnamon and odors, ointments, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, agriculture, beasts, sheep, horses, chariots. There's military elements here. And slaves and souls of men. Sister White does say that there will be slavery again in the last days. <laughs> and there is a modern form of slavery that is going on now that we'll go into a little bit later. Now, these are not just your ordinary merchants. These are not your honest greengrocer or Persian rug salesmen. It, it explains these merchants as the merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand off with the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. These are the wicked extortioners. These are, these are evil men because they've been made rich by her. The normal person, average merchant, isn't made rich by Babylon. Being a merchant itself is not a, a bad thing. Getting towards the end, it says, And the light of candles shall shine no more at all in thee. The voice of bridegroom and the voice of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. So these, these merchants are the great men of the earth. They are the, the richest, most powerful men in the earth. Notice it mixes their actions with sorcery. These two things are related. And what I'm going to show is how these merchants, the way they operate, can well indeed be called sorcery. Sorcery is a form, form of magic, and all these things are forms of deception. And indeed, the means they use is an incredible deception that enslaves the bodies and souls of men. The word sorcery there is, is the word pharmakia, which a lot of us will probably be familiar with. And that's where the word pharmacy, we get the word pharmacy from, which is the whole drug industry. So the Bible calls the pharmaceutical industry sorcery. And is there a bit of science to, to the pharmaceutical industry? There is science. It's, it's a, it is a scientific enterprise. But that doesn't mean it's not sorcery because it is employed to deceive and control and destroy. So there's a bit of science in sorcery. Okay, so let's have a look at who these merchants of Babylon are, some of these merchants are. This is from a financial advice website. This is, not, this is not some conspiracy website. I just plugged in Rothschild and Merchants, and this is what came up. 
The House of Rothschild was founded in 1776, it's an interesting year, in Frankfurt, Germany by Mayer Amschel Rothschild. Mayer fathered five boys who would establish the most successful merchant banking network in England. You notice the, the word there, merchant banking. These are the richest men in the earth, no doubt. This is the richest family in the world. From humble beginnings as a rare coin trader, Mayer quickly built a private merchant banking empire which was a choice of not only the German Prince William, but also the financer choice of the major powers of Europe. The Rothschilds became synonymous with merchant banking quality and safety. This is from Wikipedia. The Rothschilds is a wealthy family, sending from these people. The family was elevated to no rank in the Holy Roman Empire in the United Kingdom. During the 19th century, the Rothschild family possessed the largest private fortune in the world as well as the largest private fortune in modern history. The family's wealth was divided among various descendants and today their interests cover a diverse range of fields including financial services, real estate, mining, energy, mixed farming, winemaking and non-profits. So we can see all those things mentioned in Revelation 18, they're all, all mentioned in this family. Interestingly, non-profits is there. You know the Salvation Army, the, the red shield on their, on their badge. The name Rothschild in German means red shield. The, Roth, the, Reg, the, the Salvation Army is a, is a creation and op, an operation of the Rothschilds. Now, now, here's another interesting point about the Rothschilds that you might not know. It's not a conspiracy website or anything. This is from the JewishEncyclopedia.com. In the 1870s, the nationalists and reactionary parties in France desired to counterbalance the Semitic influence of the Rothschilds by establishing a banking concern which is essentially Catholic. The Rothschilds are the guardians of the papal treasure. So their title in the Jewish Encyclopedia, because they are Jewish people, they're not loyal to Jews, they're loyal to nobody except Rome, but their title is the guardians of the papal treasure. They keep the Vatican gold. And if you're the guardians of someone's money, that means that you're, you're servant to them, you're working for them. These, these people um, are employed by the church. The, the Jesuits put them there, they gave them their power, they came from obscure time and in, to become the richest family very quickly. And these merchants that I'm talking about, it's not, it's not exclusively the Rothschilds. There are a lot of merchants in the earth that work for Rome, Rockefellers and Morgans and all these people. But this is one that uh, is easy to trace. It's actually very difficult to find these things out because it's very well concealed. You don't know much about these people because they like to keep it a secret. And back to this this point on sorcery and deception. The way these, these banks operate is totally fraudulent. It is a system of theft and robbery. It certainly is a craft. And I'm just going to show a video now to show you a little bit of how banking began with the goldsmiths and how it works. The Goldsmith's Tale one idea to rule the world. In a large market town in Bavaria, the central square was filled with the sounds of people shouting, the clattering of hooves upon the flagstones, and the bang of the auctioneer's hammer as the cattle were sold to the highest bidders. This was a long time ago, before electric lights or cars had been invented, and when the people paid for their animals, they paid with shiny gold coins. The gold coins were made by the town's goldsmith. He had a coal-fired furnace which he used to melt down heavy gold bars and old jewellery. He poured the liquid gold, like chocolate, into moulds to make the shiny little gold coins. His workshop was very secure and he had guards to look after all the gold. The farmers and shopkeepers of the town trusted the goldsmith to look after their gold. When the townsfolk gave him their gold, the goldsmith gave them a special certificate in return. In the name of the king, this certificate guarantees the safe return of ten gold coins whenever the bearer demands. The certificate guaranteed they would get their gold back whenever they wanted it. It even had a picture of the king's head on it to prove it was true. Pretty soon, just about everyone had their gold safely on deposit with the goldsmith. 
and he grew rich and very fat by charging a fee for keeping the gold safe. The certificates or paper money the townsfolk received in return for their gold could be used to go shopping in the marketplace as if they were the real gold coins themselves. Everybody was happy to take the paper money because they could swap it at the goldsmith's workshop for the real gold coins any time they liked. Now the goldsmith liked to keep his money in gold too, so it was only natural that when some of the shopkeepers and farmers in the town wanted to borrow gold to buy things for their shops or animals for their farms, they would go to the richest man in town for a loan. The goldsmith could have lent them his gold, but since everyone was just as happy with the certificates, the goldsmith kept the real gold money safe in his workshop and gave them the paper money instead. However, the goldsmith was lying awake one night and he had an idea. The townsfolk all seemed perfectly happy accepting his paper money instead of real gold. So what if he just printed up some extra paper money to lend to the townsfolk when he didn't really have the gold to give them? Who would ever know? Unless everyone wanted the gold back at the same time, he could print as much paper money as he wanted. Nobody would imagine that he didn't have the gold to give them. Now he would be really rich. Nothing beats lending gold that doesn't exist. Pretty soon, everybody was borrowing the goldsmith's paper money and the marketplace was busier than ever with people shopping for all the expensive things they could never afford. Beautiful carriages with magnificent horses lined the streets. The townsfolk wore gorgeous silk clothing and sparkling jewellery and ate chocolate with every meal. But as the shopkeepers and farmers collected even more and more money and the price of everything began to rise, the townsfolk started to wonder. While they had piles of money and they felt rich, it never seemed enough to keep up with the rising cost of everything. People began to refuse to accept the paper money and demanded that they be paid in real gold coins instead. The townsfolk started to gather in the square outside the goldsmith's workshop. The angry mob waved their certificates in the air and demanded the return of the gold that the paper money represented. But the goldsmith looked out of his window at the angry townsfolk and slammed his workshop door shut. His guards stood in front of his workshop with their helmets on and their swords raised to stop the townsfolk from entering. On the fourth day, they lost their patience and broke through the line of guards to find the workshop already empty. The certificates people had accepted for the things they sold were now worthless and those with the most paper money, who thought they were the richest, were now suddenly the poorest. The goldsmith had lied to everyone. And nobody trusted paper money again for a very, very long time. But sure enough, people began to forget the lessons of the goldsmith's tale. In fact, if you look around today, the townsfolk all seem perfectly happy borrowing the goldsmith's paper money once again, just like the people in our story. The shops are busy with people using credit cards to buy all the things they could never afford. Beautiful cars and magnificent houses line the streets, and the townsfolk wear gorgeous designer clothing and take selfies with every meal. But they don't understand that the goldsmith is just up to his old tricks again and that he will print more and more paper money until it becomes completely worthless once more. We saw how the, the system of banking works, that it's, it's a, a way that, a way to, for one, one person to get rich,
to loan money that they don't even have. It's a, it's a system of total fraud. It began with those goldsmiths. It's actually a very old system. Rome took hold of this, this, this deception, as they do with all things, and, and ran with it. The inventors of modern banking were the Templar Knights. Since their founding on, in French soil in 1118, the Knights Templar had grown from a pair of self-impoverished knights hoping to keep Muslim terrorists from molesting pilgrims in the Holy Land to a mammoth organization controlling international finance and politics. The Templars invented modern banking by applying an oriental invention to their commerce. Agents of the Chinese emperor Kao Tsung, inventor of paper currency called flying money, sought to trade with the Middle East. Evidently, Kao Tsung's agents introduced the knights to this new medium of exchange created out of merchant drafts. The Templars enhanced their already booming business by accepting current accounts, deposit accounts, deposits of jewels, valuables, and title deeds, making loans and advance charging fees because the church forbade interest, and acting as agents for the secure transmission of such things, adding circulating letters of credit to serve as paper currency. By 1300, presiding over the world economy from their Paris office, the Templars had become an international power unto themselves. Engaged in diplomacy at the highest levels of state from the Holy Land westward, they set the tastes, the goals, the morality, the rules of the civilized world. Kings did their bidding. When King Henry III of England threatened to confiscate certain of the order's properties, he was upbraided by the master of Templar in the city of London, saying, What sayest thou, O king? So long as thou dost exercise justice, thou wilt reign. But if thou infringe it, thou wilt cease to be king. So you can see how, by the use of banking, these, these, this group of poor knights uh, had began to usurp even the power of countries. And it was all through this, this system of fraudulent banking that they had gained control. After, after this, in, actually in 1302, the Templars received a blow from the King of France, who'd had enough of their meddling, had them arranged before the courts and found them guilty of blasphemy, which indeed was true because they were an occult society and revered a god they called Sataniel. King Philip had 50 of them burned at the stake. After that, they faded into obscurity until Ignatius Loyola took up where they left off and began his Jesuit order, and the banking craft that the Templars had engineered continued to be used to control the nations. Now let's skip down to the 17th century with the Bank of England. The Bank of England came into existence in 1694 when the King William of Orange needed money to finance his war with France. In the centuries leading up to this, the previous English monarchs, like Elizabeth I, had tirelessly opposed the bankers' attempts to control the country. They understood the danger from these people. But this king succumbed to them, and England had, has been enslaved ever since to this system of fraud and robbery. Now, understand this point here that I'm about to, I'm about to talk about. Uh, this is important because this is how the central banks of today, how all these banks work like the, the Australian, what is it, the, the Reserve Bank of Australia, the Federal Reserve, all these banks, they all operate on this, in this way. This new Bank of England was a privately owned bank, despite sounding like it was run by the government. Instead of the government, isu and, and this is the way it worked, instead of the government issuing its own money for free, like it had done in the past, and circulating it around the, the, the nation, this new bank was to issue the nation's money and loan it to the government, which in turn had to pay back the bank what it had loaned at interest. This, the, so the bank, this new bank was a private organization that printed money and loaned it to the government for the government to use. And the government had to then pay back the bank and it charged interest on the money. The, 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 way, the way it used to work was the government prints their own money, circulates it, and, and there's, no, there's no fee. But now, by some amazing way, the, these bankers had, had deceived the rulers into, into adopting this new policy. It's an incredible... Um, it's the biggest heist in history. Listen to the, a quote by the one who created the Bank of England, who was a Scotsman called William Patterson, and he famously said in 1694... The bank hath benefit of interest on all monies which it creates out of nothing. 
the later bankers weren't so open about this. They kind of concealed it. But this guy, he, he just said it outright. It has interest on monies which creates out of nothing. They, they, they created this money out of nothing and it has to get paid back to them. Can, can you see the, 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 the sorcery in this? It's total deception. We know the Bible verse in Proverbs 22, 7. The rich rules over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. Good News Bible says, Poor people are slaves of the rich, borrow money, and you are the lender's slave. Through this system, the bankers, which we saw, the Rothschild is the guardian of the Vatican treasury, they have enslaved the nations and, and the individuals. I'm just going to tell a little story about Rothschild and how he came to control this, this bank, Bank of England the private bank, and it was a, an amazing, um, it's an amazing story, in the, and it involves Napoleon and the Battle of Waterloo. It says, the Battle of Waterloo was fought on June 18, 1815, 200 miles northeast of Paris, when Napoleon suffered his final defeat. Leading up to the battle, the outcome was certainly in doubt. If Napoleon had not been detained by the wet weather, he would have won the battle. Nathan Rothschild had stated a trusted agent, Rothworth, on the side of the battlefield closer to the English Channel. Once the battle had been decided, Rothworth took off for the Channel, delivering the news to Nathan Rothschild a full 24 hours before Wellington's own courier by the use of the fastest horses and homing pigeons that, that flew over the Channel. If Wellington had been defeated and Napoleon was again loose on the continent, Britain's financial situation would become grave indeed. Upon receiving this intelligence back in London, Nathan Rothschild proceeded to create a panic on the stock exchange. Other nervous investors saw that Rothschild was selling en masse. This could only mean one thing. Napoleon must have won. Wellington must have lost. Soon everyone was selling their British government bonds. The prices dropped sharply. But then Rothschild started secretly buying up the bonds through his agents for just a fraction of what they were worth just hours before. By this crafty device, Rothschild came to dominate the bond market and seize control of the privately owned Bank of England. He had multiplied his wealth 20 times in three days of trading. By the mid-1800s, the Rothschilds became the richest family in the world, bar none. And this is a telling quote here we see. I care not what puppet is placed upon the throne of England to rule the empire on which the sun never sets. The man who controls Britain's money supply controls the British Empire, and I control the British money supply. So since this time, since, since 1815, the, the England has been controlled by the Rothschilds and pretty much the entire world, ultimately, by these people, the, the Vatican, who, which, which we know work for the Vatican. Remember, this was in the, the deadly wound stage. This was in the time of the of weakness of Rome. This is in Nahum. Nahum's talking about Nineveh, but as we know, all these things have end-time applications, and I believe this has an end-time application to Rome. Woe unto the bloody city, it is full of lies and robbery. The play departed of North. Certainly the system of banking is a, is a system of robbery. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favoured harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts, that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcraft. We can see here how England would, and was sold by these deceptions. <coughs> and the same thing with this banking system. Uh, families are sold through, through this system. People are enslaved. There's a terrible deception. Like Vatican City, London's inner city is also a privately owned corporation or city-state, located right smack in the heart of Greater London. It became a sovereign state in 1694 when King William III of Orange privatized and turned the Bank of England over to the bankers. By 1812, Nathan Rothschild crashed the English stock market and scammed control of the Bank of England. Today, the city-state of London is the world's financial power center and the wealthiest square mile on the face of the earth. It houses the Rothschild-controlled Bank of England, Lloyds of London, the London Stock Exchange, all British banks, the branch offices of 385 foreign banks, and 70 U.S. banks. It has its own courts, its own laws, its own flag, 
and its own police force. It's not part of Greater London or England or the British Commonwealth and pays no taxes. The city-state of London houses Fleet Street's newspaper and publishing monopolies. It is also the headquarters for worldwide English Freemasonry and headquarters for the worldwide money cartel known as the Crown. Contrary to popular belief, the Crown is not the royal family or the British monarch. The Crown is the private corporate city-state of London. It has a council of 12 members who rule the corporation under a mayor called the Lord Mayor. The Lord Mayor and his 12-member council serve as proxies or representatives who sit in for 13 of the world's wealthiest, most powerful banking families. This ring of 13 ruling families includes the Rothschild family, the Warburg family, the Oppenheimer family, and the Schiff family. These families and their descendants run the Crown Corporation of London. The Crown Corporation holds the title to worldwide Crown land in Crown colonies like Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. The British Parliament and the British Prime Minister serve as a public front for the hidden power of these ruling Crown families. Like the city-state of London and the Vatican, a third city-state was officially created in 1982. That city-state is called the District of Columbia and is located on 10 square miles of land in the heart of Washington. The District of Columbia flies its own flag and has its own independent constitution. Although geographically separate, the city-states of London, the Vatican, and the District of Columbia are one interlocking empire called Empire of the City. The flag of Washington's District of Columbia has three red stars, one for each city-state in the three-city empire. This corporate empire of three city-states controls the world economically through London's inner city, militarily through the District of Columbia, and spiritually through the Vatican. The constitution for the District of Columbia operates under a tyrannical Roman law known as Lex Fori, which bears no resemblance to the U.S. Constitution. When Congress passed the Act of 1871, it created a separate corporate government for the District of Columbia. This treasonous act allowed the District of Columbia to operate as a corporation outside the original Constitution of the United States and outside of the best interests of American citizens. So you see these three elements of Babylon and how they work together, which is part of the reason for this sermon, to show the financial element which is seated in the city of London, which is a, another private corporation. Interesting there, the Crown Corporation's m motto is Domini Dirigi Nos, Master Directus. You can see who their master is from the flag. This is a quote from the mother of, of Nathan Rothschild, who the one who was involved in that war, Napoleon's war. She, she said, if my sons did not want wars, there would be none. So these these people are responsible for most, if not all, of the wars in modern times. They have been fomented by these banksters. Also revolutions. Tsar Nicholas II, the one that was murdered by the Bolsheviks, not long before his, his murder and the rise of the Bolsheviks, the Rothschilds approached him and asked him if they could set up a central bank. He refused not long after he was dead and his family murdered. The Bolsheviks were actually funded by uh, the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers from America. Every, every country in the world has a, has a central bank in, like this, a Rothschild central bank. In the year 2000, there were eight countries without a Rothschild-controlled central bank. Uh, we can see these ones here. Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya have all been invaded, and, and they've now got a central a Rothschild bank. Sudan had a coup. But these, these last four uh, are the ones that have still holding out, that don't have central bank. And we know all about these countries that are in the news. Cuba is a bit of an anomaly there, but we know North Korea, Iran, and Syria, they're all on the list. Syria is in the process of being invaded. So it's all about the banking, the, uh, the, the, the wars we see around the world. And another thing, we see this craft being used, this, this, this deceit. Um, causing them to prosper. Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln said, 
regarding these bankers. He was a good man, this Abraham Lincoln. He says, the government, these are my words, not the private banking elite, should create, issue, and circulate all the currency and credit needed to satisfy the spending power of the government and the buying power of the consumers. The privilege of creating and issuing money is not only the supreme prerogative of the government, but it is in the government's greatest creative opportunity. By the adoption of these principles, the taxpayers will be saved immense sums of interest. Money will cease to be master and become the servant of humanity. See, See this man, he, he understood the way these things work. Yeah. He, he had the good of people in, in his interest. The bankers did not. This was in a Times of London editorial regarding what he said and what he was doing. If that mischievous financial policy, which had its origin in the North American Republic, should become indurated down to a fixture, then that government will furnish its own money with, without cost. It will pay off debts and be without debt. This is a bad thing according to them. It will have all the money necessary to carry on its commerce. It will become prosperous beyond precedent in the history of civilized governments of the world. The brains and the wealth of all countries will go to North America. That government must be destroyed or it will destroy every monarchy on the globe. You see, the, these, these words are straight from the bankers, in, instilling fear in the monarchies to, to, to rally against this nation. And we know what happened to Abraham Lincoln. Interestingly, JFK was another one who attempted to end the federal res the banking system controlled by the, the bankers, and we know that they were both assassinated. The Federal Reserve is another central bank owned by the same cartel bankers, the Crown, that own the Bank of England. The Reserve Bank in Australia is the same. It is interesting to note that in America, income tax was introduced at this exact same time that the Federal Reserve Bank, which is the, the bank that, that prints money and loans it to the, peop to the government at interest, so that income tax was introduced at the same time in 1913 and Australia likewise in 1915 as a means to, that, is, that was necessary to pay the debt that the government has incurred by lending money from the bankers instead of printing its own money for free. Prior to that, income tax didn't exist. We had other taxes, but not income tax. Therefore, income tax, instead of funding public works, like we think it does, almost all goes into the pockets of these private bankers who have deceived governments into believing that instead of printing their own money, they should borrow it off them at interest. We've heard about the billions and trillions of debt we owe as a nation, and America owes. But who are we indebted to? It's, it's, a, it's the bankers. The nations are imbe indebted to these foreign bankers that create money out of nothing. Got to be the greatest heist of all time. Woodrow Wilson, upon being deceived into signing the Federal Reserve Bank into existence, says, I am a most unhappy man. I have unwittingly ruined my country. A great industrial nation is controlled by its system of credit. Our system of credit is concentrated. The growth of the nation, therefore, and all our activities are in the hands of a few men. We have come to be one of the worst ruled, one of the most completely controlled and dominated governments in the civilized world. No longer a government by free opinion, no longer a government by conviction and the vote of the majority, but a government by the opinions and duress of a small group of dominant men. See, he understood what he'd done. He wasn't a bad man, but he made a big mistake. And we saw here that the, the, the borrow money and you're the lender's slave. Um, Again, just reiterating that point. You see how this system of modern slavery operates? These fraudsters can own, they can crash the market whenever they, they like, like they did in 1929, 2008, causing people to foreclose on their loans when they lose their jobs and take everything they have. This is the way that the, the, the system operates. They, they drop the interest rates, everyone gets loans, and then, they, then they, they, they reduce the money supply and everyone goes bankrupt. They... they foreclose on their loans, and the bank takes all the property. It's, it, it's a constant cycle, back and forth, back and forth. The Bible says, Ellen White says, that there will be slavery in the last days, and perhaps once the, markets, the bottom falls out of the market again and everyone loses everything, people might become slaves. I, I don't know what, exactly what's going to happen, but it reminded me of in Egypt, when, when there was a famine in Egypt, 
and the people lost their crops, everything. They lost everything. They were starving to death. And the, the Egyptians came to Pharaoh or came to Joseph, who was the who was the, the, the president then, the prime minister, and said, Wherefore shall we die before thine eyes? Both we and our land, buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die. See, these people were they had no choice but to sell themselves as slaves. You know, once this, this world and this just giant labyrinth of deception, which is the financial system, collapses, what are people going to do? You know, there might be a situation like this. I'm not sure, but, you know, it would, it would, it would fit. In Revelation 13, verse 16, starting off where I left off in the last sermon, talking about the... The, the United States, and he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark. So here we, we're introducing this thing about buying and selling. Unless you receive this mark, you will not be able to buy or sell. You, the basic necessities of life will be denied those who refuse this. Now, there's a lot of Christians in the world that believe that the mark of the beast is a microchip that is going to be implanted in the hand. Now, obviously, that's not the truth. We know that the truth about the mark of the beast is, we know who the beast is. The beast is the Catholic Church, and they, and they tell us who the mark is, that Sunday is our mark of authority. This is a plain and simple truth to us. However, we already have microchips in our passports, in our credit cards. This is the way the world is heading, and there's no doubt that the world is heading towards a cashless society. In Australia, we see this payments over $10,000 to be banned as government targets a $50 million black economy. The government will employ mobile strike teams and dob, in, and dob them in hotlines in its $50 billion effort to wage war on dodgy tradies and businesses. Is Australia on the brink of becoming a completely cashless society? You can see the way they're selling this thing, dodgy tradies and the black economy. We're headed towards a cashless society and... How easy in a cashless society would it be to, to enforce these, 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 these religious laws? If you, if, you're not, um, if you don't receive the mark of the beast, if you don't keep Sunday by, I don't know how it would be, tapping on at mass or tapping into work on Sabbath, turn off the chip, no more buying and selling for you. It's, um, you know, I, I, I'm not saying this is exactly how it's going to go. This, I'm just being a little bit speculative here. However, you can see how this could, this could work. But one thing's for sure, there's, we're heading towards a cashless society. So, just to recap, this is what we've seen, the globalist trinity, the Vatican, the spiritual head, the, the Washington, the military, and the finance city of London, all these are integral parts of the globalist system of control of Babylon that has been used to, to deceive the world. I will just finish with a with a Bible verse here. In James, the book that Brother Gannon was reading this morning, he says, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into the, such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanish away. You know, we don't know how long how long we've got. You know, look, looking at all these things happening, it's this... This world is, is, is wrapping up. And the, the amount of control is, is getting like George Orwell in 1984. The, the, times are, the times are ending. We don't know, you know, we don't know when our life will, will, will we cut, might be cut short. You know, this is what we ought to say. We ought to say that if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. You know, as Paul says, to be content with the things we have and not get wrapped up in all these this, this worldly things. Personally, I, I, I can't wait till, till, the, till all, this, all this finishes, all the lies and deception are, are over and, and um, only truth uh, reigns in the world. I just pray we can take James's words to heart in, in light of all these things. I invite you to kneel with me as we close in prayer.